and I'm really expected to follow that. Yes. <coughs> well done, Cliff. Well done. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. figure out how to organize myself. Let's just open in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we come before you this morning a needy people. Father, we just ask you to go before us to give wisdom, give understanding. Especially, Father, as we open your word that you uh, would guide and direct the conversation desire that we have, Father, in all things is to bring glory to you and your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We just pray these things in his worthy and precious name. Amen. 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 This morning, the last song that we sang in the remembrance meeting <clears throat> was We Worship Thee. The first verse of that song read, Thou Son of God, eternal word, who heaven and earth's foundation laid, upholding by thy word and power the universe thy hands have made. We worship thee, all glorious Lord, forever be thy name adored. We worship thee, all glorious Lord, forever be thy name adored. As we start this morning, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to continue to <clears throat> look at Noah and the flood. As Brother Dan asked me this morning if I was going to flood the audience this morning, and that no, we're just going to talk about a little bit of water. But uh, to lay the groundwork for the message this morning, we'll look in Genesis 6, and let's put our reading in at verse 5. And we've read these already, and I'm sure we'll do that again in the future. But Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? Uh, seems like there's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon would say. Verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. If you'll excuse me just a moment. I am losing my voice. But I've got a solution. Whenever you're losing your voice and you're speaking, there's a, a great thing out on the market of all things called Fisherman's Friend. Need water? I've got water. Oh, thank you. And uh, the reason they call it Fisherman's Friend because when you're fishing, you start coughing, you scare all the fish away. But Fisherman's Friend has to be one of the foulest tasting <laughs> lozenges you can put in your throat. Susanna's back there saying, yeah. <laughs> But it's good stuff. It really works. All right. We see the state of man. We see the position that God has in dealing with man. And that brings us to the flood. Got a question for you as we start this morning. A little thought on geography and geology. Show of hands, how many of you have visited Utah? 
How many of you have visited the national parks in Utah? Amazing. My wife and I had the privilege of doing that last week. It's not the first time we've done that, but we continue to be amazed. But as we were doing that, we were struck with an, an observation that ties in really nicely with the messages on Noah. One of the parks that we visited was Bryce. In fact, my wife and I stood right up on that. There's an outcropping right up there called Bryce Point. We've got a picture of that area. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. But what struck us as we were traveling and why this ties in with the message. We went from Kansas to Colorado, through Utah, down into Arizona, into New Mexico, back through Colorado, <laughs> back through Kansas. No matter where we traveled, any time, especially out in the country where there were mesas, you would have this vast expanse or maybe a mesa over here 10 miles away and one over here five miles away. And as you looked at them, the strata of layers of the cliffs as they were, as they were eroded away was identical. There would be red and there would be yellow and orange and brown. You'd look at that one and you'd look at that one way up and they'd be identical. Now, how could that be? Now, I've got an app on my phone which tells us what our elevations are when we're traveling. I had that phone out a lot, checking elevations. Whether we were Colorado or Utah, wherever, at certain elevations, the strata layers in the cliffs was identical. You know where I'm going with this? If I'm in Western Colorado, and I see a mesa that's got this strata layer, and I'm in northern Arizona, and I see this mesa that's got this strata layer, and they're <clears throat> identical. How can that be? How in the world can that be? The other thing is, all these parks that we go to, the first thing we like to do is go to the visitor center and view the video, and they give you a background. They all have one thing in common, water. They all start out, if they're totally accurate except they're off a few years, <laughs> like maybe 50 billion years. <laughs> but they all start out with the same thing. At one point in time, this area was under a vast lake of water. Well, after you cover six states and you keep hearing issues, that's, really, that's not a lake anymore, that's more like a vast ocean of water. And what it demonstrated to Karen and I was just a reinforcement of what we've been seeing in what we've read about the flood. We went from, we were from about 5,500 feet up to 11,500 feet. You know what? The strata layer stayed the same. At 5,500 feet, they were a different color but they were the same. At 11.5, they were a different color, but the stratolera were the same in those elevations. Beloved, that's not a coincidence. <clears throat> Something caused that to happen. The other thing I chuckled about <clears throat> was when they were talking about, the, you know, 80 billion years ago, there was this vast amount of water and then this, that, and the other. Yet when you go to Bryce Canyon, those spires are called hoodoos, by the way. Those spires <clears throat> are very fragile, and they're continually changing. Where we stood on some of these points taking pictures, there were signs that said, in five years, this area will no longer be here because it will be eroded away, and the fence will be, you know, four feet back from here. I thought to myself, now, wait a minute, if this happened 50 billion years ago, how can there be anything left if they're eroding away that quickly? 
they kind of contradict themselves. <clears throat> the reason I'm going through this, it just gave us the confidence <clears throat> as we saw God's creation that it's accurate, that it's right. I, I shared this Wednesday night at a prayer meeting, but one thing that Karen and I <clears throat> really stuck out through the whole trip, we had a chance to visit with a lot of people. And fortunately, the, the crowds, interestingly enough, were not that big. I mean, you, it wasn't a standing room only, but there were a lot of people moving around. When we were at places like this, we didn't hear a single comment about politics or about the war or about the election or about the problems in the world or in the United States or anything else. The comment that we continually heard was, wow, what a creation God has made. Exact words. They attributed it not to 80 billion dollars, 80 million dollars, 80 million years of evolution and all that. It's like, wow, look at what God created. We were encouraged by that. We were really encouraged by that. This morning in Sunday school, John made this statement. He said that noise, sometimes you just have to get away. There was one point out on Bryce Point that we found that they had logs. You could sit there and you could just sit and look and just take it in. And we were there on Thursday. And then on Friday, we went another route. We came back late that afternoon. We came by Bryce. We came back into Bryce and went to the same point and sat there. And we just sat there for an hour. The solitude, even with people walking by, the solitude, and it affected everybody. You can really meditate on things of God in, in, in all of that. So I just wanted to share that with you as we started getting into this area of, um, of um, Noah and the flood and, and where we are uh, today in that. Psalm 104, 5 and 6 makes this statement. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. When you look at scripture and believe scripture, it's not hard to, to, to envision the water standing 15 cubits above a 14,000 foot mountain or a 24,000 foot mountain or whatever the elevation might be. In our last message we covered who was Noah, where did Noah live, and where did Noah build the ark. I think the best summary of who Noah was is found in what I just read here in Genesis 8 and 9. Noah was just and perfect. And he walked with God. That was his testimony. He was a man of God. He was consistently a man of God. I also noted that based on a document called the Sumerian King List, and this is a historical document, that Noah was listed as an elite or an elder in the city, in the city he lived in. <clears throat> and it was noted that as an elite that Noah was a very wealthy man. He was one that was held in high esteem by all who knew him. Now think about what we hear as Noah starts building the ark and the people around making fun of him and all of that. Yet for 500 years this man was held in high esteem by those people around him. <coughs> and I have to think that even though a lot of people ridiculed him, but he continued to be held in high esteem, and that is why a lot of the things that were accomplished were able to be accomplished. We'll get into that in a later message. We saw Noah almost certainly lived in Mesopotamia, and it's a land situated between and around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and we conclude that if Noah lived there, that he probably constructed 
the art there. Logic would tell us that would be the case. As with the information I used last time, just for the record, the sources I'll use today and in any future messages on Noah, first and foremost, of course, is the Bible. Secondly, there are extra biblical documents and public publications. Number one, the works of Josephus gives us a lot of background on Noah. There is a, a periodical called The Perspective on Science and Christian Faith, which is published by the American Scientific Affiliation. That is a group of uh, scientists since the 1940s that are believing Christians that have worked hard in establishing what scripture says versus what science says and so forth. And then lastly, I mentioned the Sumerian king list. And that list covers the history of the various city-states and kingdoms in southern Mesopotamia during the late 3rd and early 2nd millennial B.C. Yeah, you have to be careful when you're ministering out of the Bible that you don't put too much weight into historical documents that are extra-biblical. But by the same token, they sometimes, when they're not contrary to Scripture, can provide a broader picture of what things were like in that day and age. Okay, as mentioned, we had three questions. Lord willing, we're going to cover a couple more. The two questions probably that we'll look at this morning are as follows. Number one, where did Noah get the resolve to persevere in the face of opposition from those around him? And number two, where did Noah get the money to build the ark? As we look at these two questions, as throughout the entire study of Noah, I would like to have us as a body consider the parallels between ourselves today and what Noah endured back in his day from the perspective of our testimony as believers in an unbelieving world and secondly our attitude as believers about our possessions, our finances, our occupations, and our wealth. First question, where did Noah get that resolve? Uh, as we start out, I want to be very clear about something. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does it say that Noah was ridiculed. Now, somebody's going to grab the Bible and start flipping through to find the verses that say that's not right. But there is nowhere that says Noah was mocked. There was nowhere that says that the neighborhood thought he was crazy. Nothing. But there's a logical conclusion based in what we already read earlier today about the state of people, the unbelieving world in that time. We see in Peter that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And just as today, being a preacher of righteousness, Noah would have been subjected to scoffers. Unbelievers that would make fun of him and what he was preaching. Add to that the aspect of building the ark. And even those people who would be good friends of Noah would have to be scratching their heads in. What's happened to Noah? What's going on with this guy? This makes no sense whatsoever. So I think based on especially what we as believers suffer today in ridicule when we're putting forth a testimony for the Lord, it certainly is reasonable to assume that in that day there were numerous people, especially it's the entire world that is unbelieving, to, as it were, make fun of Noah, possibly to his back, because, as I said, Noah was respected. But don't you think that happens to us today? How many of our worldly, unbelieving friends that we would like to consider our friends, how many behind our back make fun of us? 
just can't believe that we would have the attitudes that we would have. So it's, it, it is a, a plausible situation to consider that Noah was ridiculed. In, in that day when people, when the populace really preferred to forget about God, Noah made God the center of his life. That would set him apart. He was a portrait of a man who not only believed God, but he continued the work that God gave him, even when those around him said, this does not make any sense. Notice something at the start. In Noah's ordinary life, and this is an important point, in Noah's ordinary life, he believed God, unequivocally. Uh, this was before the big test would have came when God spoke to him about the ark. But because Noah believed in God in the little things and had faith in God in the little things, when the really, really, really big thing came along, you don't see anything in Scripture where Noah says, now wait a minute, God, this makes no sense. Noah believed God in the big things because he already had a consistent <clears throat> faith in what God would provide and do in his life. <clears throat> no matter what was said, no matter what was done, no matter what actions were taken, he continued steadfastly for God. Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5. I think there's a couple of verses here that have application directly to Moses. Or not directly to Noah. Deuteronomy 5, 32 and 33. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or the left. Pay attention to that. You'll maintain a straight course. You'll not turn to the right or to the left. You won't allow yourself to be taken off track in serving me. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Beloved, those words are just as appropriate back to Noah and to us today. James speaks of one with wavering faith, tossed to the winds, and that's not what God would have for us. He would have us in faith believing that the course he has put us on is the course that he wants. The Lord's will is done by those who know him, whether it's on earth or whether it's in heaven. If the Lord says go, they go. Conversely, if the Lord says stay, they stay. They don't argue, they don't question, if it is clear from the Lord, then that's good enough for them. Noah wouldn't turn to the right hand or the left hand because of the faith he had. In the building of the ark, Noah fulfilled and carried out God's commandments explicitly and completely down to the last nail. He never varied one way or the other. So where did, God, where did Noah get that resolve to withstand? <laughs> Simple. He took the strength from God. God gave him the resolve to, pers to persevere. And the proof of that is where it says in Scripture that Noah was in such constant communication with God that we read in 6-9 of Genesis, he walked with God. It's not said about too many men in scripture, is it? He walked with God. Charles Spurgeon 
1890 had this to say about Noah, and I quote, Noah is the picture of one who is the Lord's witness during evil days and lives through them faithfully enduring unto the end. In Noah, we see one who will engage in conflict, bear themselves bravely amid backsliding and apostasy until they see, shall see the powers of evil trodden under their feet. Beloved, apply that to yourselves today. God's provision, God's direction, God's support is absolutely sufficient to allow us, and no matter what we see in the news, no matter what we see in the country, no matter what we see happening, allows us to persevere. And we know, and I always say this to my children, we know how the last chapter of the last book is written. Amen. We know how this is all going to come to an end. And there will be a day when all powers of evil are trodden under feet. What a blessing it would be if we would see that in our lifetime. The lesson for us is to have, uh, to, the lesson for us is that if God gives us a great thing to do or puts us in the presence of a terrible trial to have the faith that he will give us all needed to persevere in that. But first, as Noah, we need to have the faith in the day-to-day, -day, everyday living. If we don't have the faith, if we don't practice that faith in our daily living, Monday through Sunday, every week, then when the really big one comes, we're going to have a hard time appropriating that strength that God gives. We can obey God even if the world or even if our friends or even if our neighbors or even if our families oppose us in something that God has given us to do. And I'm sure most of us here at some point has had a family member that opposed us for what the Lord has given. Karen and I both ran into that when we first came to know the Lord. I had my father one time ask me what kind of a cult I had joined. That's opposition, beloved. And we deal with that and we have to have the faith in God to persevere in the face of that. So, big question for us as we move on. Do we possess the faith of Noah? And that's not just a, a throwaway question. Think about it. Let it dwell in your heart. Do I possess that kind of faith? And if I don't, what do I need to do to appropriate that kind of faith? before a holy God. Our next question, where did Noah get the money to build the ark? Now, uh, put in your mind, we had up on the screen at the start of these messages, a picture of the ark. My beloved bride standing in front of it, you couldn't see her, she was about that tall, and this massive ark filled the picture. 450 feet, 75 feet wide, 48 feet high. Do you think it cost any money to acquire the lumber and the pitch and the whatever to build that thing? It would have required a lot. Even in that day, even without inflation, and we don't know, maybe inflation was twice as bad then as now, it would have cost a huge amount to build the ark. As I said, the, the Sumerian king list listed Noah as an elite. He was a very wealthy man, and he would have resources to purchase the materials needed to build the ark. But even Noah would know he didn't have enough resources to build the ark, and that's where the point is. Noah had the correct mindset, and that's exemplified in Deuteronomy 8. 
We've been in Deuteronomy 6. Just flip over a couple pages to Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 through 18. Deuteronomy 8, 17. And thou sayest in thy heart, my power and, thy, and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. Ah, but there's a cha-ching in 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to give wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. <clears throat> Noah had the right mindset because of his faith in God. He knew in his heart without question that he would have enough to build the ark. He had such faith, he knew that if God asked him to build the ark, he would be able to build the ark. What are we told in the New Testament? The foolishness of a man that starts a project without counting the cost. I would contend that Noah never had a chance to count the cost. I would suggest that when Noah started, he didn't know what the cost would be. I would also suggest that it did not stumble Noah one bit because he knew the very God of the universe. He knew the very one that created the heavens and the earth. He knew the very one that had given him whatever wealth he had. And he knew that if God said, build it, I'll build it. And God will provide. That's where our provision comes from. Now think about this, and this is where it gets to be a very personal application. Noah obeyed, no matter what the cost would be to him personally. He was content to sing, and, and, and think about this for a minute. There are some in here that have a certain amount of wealth, and others that have very little. But think about this for a minute. He was content to sing, all, not 10%, not 40%, but to sink all of his capital, all of his income, all of his resources into that one single venture. Now, what do you think the naysayers of the day would have said to Noah, the man who was held in high esteem by his neighbors? Think they say, that is a great investment, well, <clears throat> go for it. You know that as what we read in scripture and what we see in extra biblical accounts, that they would have contended, Noah, this is really a poor speculation. Go put the money in the stock market. It'll, it'll give you a whole lot better return. Noah, this is a very unwise use of the wealth that you have. But no matter what, Noah was willing to carry out God's will, no matter what it cost him. And here's, here's the baseline. Noah knew that whatever he had was God's anyway. He had the right attitude about his wealth. God told him to build, and build he would. He really didn't count the cost. Because he knew that God knew before he asked him to do it that the cost would be covered. Now that's a bold statement, beloved. But I think that Noah had such faith in God that he knew that no matter what, God would not ask him to start if God would not give him the ability to finish. There's a lesson for us to learn there. If it's from God... Do we sit around and do we count the cost? Or do we say, God, we're in this. No matter what, we're going to build this. We're going to move forward with it. God provides as we build. I got three scriptures as we close. Go to Malachi. Malachi, just before Matthew. Such a small book, I keep going past it. Malachi chapter 3, 
It's an interesting portion. And I want you to focus on the right things here, not on the wrong things. Malachi 3, verse 10. In verse 9, he says, you know, you have robbed me. God says, you have robbed me of the people. They say, well, how have we robbed you? He says, in your tithes and offerings. But in 10, he says this. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me, and there is the key. Prove me now, herewith. Do we have enough faith, beloved, to prove God's faithfulness? To prove God's provision? I mean, he says right here, prove me now, prove me saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and there shall not be room enough to receive it. Don't focus on one thing there and that's the word tithe. I don't, I, I really don't know if I've ever had a big enough conversation with the oversight within this meeting but I've got an absolute opinion about the tithe. That was a wonderful Old Testament con uh, concept, but it does not apply today to the believer. Because, beloved, 100% of what we have is God's, not 10%. And if God calls us to give 10% or 40% or 90%, we can prove God. And not only will he cover that, but he'll also continue to provide the elders won't talk to me after the meeting, that's fine, but that, I, I really believe that. I think the tithe is a hindrance. I hear people say, well, I tithe 10%, and I say, shame on you. Why don't you tithe 100%? And the Lord will provide in all of your needs and cover all of your needs. <clears throat> Turn to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> This gets into God loving and cheerful giver. But 2 Corinthians 9, chapter, I mean, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. Noah had all sufficiency, even if Noah gave his last or whatever it would have been to buy a board he knew that he had enough to buy that next board because God had been faithful in his provision all sufficiency abound in every good work then over a few pages to Philippians chapter 9 I'm sorry Philippians chapter 4 there is no Philippians chapter 9 Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Philippians 4, 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Noah lived by that. Can we live by that? Do we believe that God will supply all of our needs? And this is contingent on us living within his will and doing his will and doing his work. <clears throat> but are we con content with that? Are we willing to obey God's direction in how we invest our dollars, how we invest our resources into those things that <clears throat> have eternal value, no matter what the cost is to us personally? You don't hear a lot of ministry on giving and I, I agree that it, it, it's up to the individual and it's between the individual's heart and God but beloved if we don't have an attitude that every opportunity we have to give to the Lord's work that we willingly give to the Lord's work we are missing out greatly on his blessings 
It's imperative. It's imperative that we do not rob ourselves of the blessings that we get when we give. When we give money, when we give of our talents, when we give of our resources in all ways. Remember the widow's might. Did she have a lot to give? Guess what, beloved? She gave all that she had. Not 10% of what she had. Not wondering if she would have enough for tomorrow. But because of her love and faith in the Lord, she gave it all. All to him I owe. And that's a, a true statement. It's not ours. It's God's. Noah had that attitude. And this kind of ministry can sometimes get bogged down. But don't ever forget, don't walk away this morning without sticking in your mind that what you have is not yours. What you have is God's and he has made us stewards of what's his. And it's a tremendous privilege, but it's also a tremendous responsibility. Closing, just as Noah felt sure that no matter the cost, no matter the cost, God would provide as he built. Beloved, we can be sure that whatever sacrifices the Lord asks of us, that sacrifice will not be more than what he can provide us to meet that sacrifice. Let's close. Father, we thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for lessons like we see in Noah. Father, it, it's too easy to <clears throat> read a few scriptures and say, oh, that's really a nice Bible story. Let's tell the children about it. Let's envision this, this ark on, on the water with Noah sticking his head out the window and the giraffe's head sticking up and a few elephants and stuff. But Father, there's, there's much more to the lessons that we can learn from your word than the warm fuzzies of a children's story. Might we truly appropriate, Father, what you have for us. Might we realize, Father, that in the realm of eternity that we have nothing except for what you provide for us not just in our resources, but in our salvation. Father, in the realm of eternity, we truly owe all that we have to you and to your precious Son. Thank you for the time, Father, we commit it to you. And we pray these things in the worthy and precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.